Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to MHTV tonight. We're really, really delighted to have Mark Bradford with us. Hello, Mark. Um, Hi, what we're going to be doing? Hello. It's what we're going to be doing is we're talking about um, some of the changes that are being um, coming on board. When we're going to be taking your questions. Um, we're going to have a nice informal conversation about some of the things that are going on happening today. Um, I'll hand you over now to David, who's going to tell you a little bit about the social media so that you know how to join in with us. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you tonight. I'm Dave Monday, Lead Professional Officer with Unite Union in the Health Sector. Uh, I am on social media tonight. And uh, if you want to join in with the conversation, obviously, you can comment on the Facebook live stream. Uh, you can also comment on Twitter. And all you have to do uh, is include the hashtag MHTV. Uh, hopefully, there won't be too much background noise for me tonight. But I've got three kids homeschooling that are in and out all over the place. So uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. But over to you, Nikki. Fantastic. Oh, and before we get started, um, obviously we normally have Vanessa with us, but it's her birthday today, so she's got the day off, which is reasonable, I think. So happy birthday, Vanessa. Take care. <laughs> Consider that your celebration. So just before we get started, I think it might be really useful because I know we have like a range of people who watch, some of whom might not be aware of, of Mark's role. So Mark, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What your role is? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, so I, I'm Mark Radford. I'm the Chief Nurse of Health Education England and Deputy CNO, and more recently um, working as the Vaccine Workforce Deployment Lead as part of the Vaccine Delivery Programme. So um, I, I have a, a number of hats to wear, but obviously a critical one is obviously the support of students uh, across a wide range of professional backgrounds. So nurses, mm. midwives, and also uh, allied health professionals are part of my board role. Mm. So this is a really, really busy time for you. So thank you very much for your for your time, taking some time out to talk to us today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how your journey progressed, how you came to be the chief nurse? Yeah, thanks. Okay. So um, I actually did a degree in nursing um, back in the early 90s. And it was quite uncommon then. We were still obviously training in hospitals and mm. in colleges. So I did a, um, a Bachelor of Science degree at Birmingham City University mm. called UCE at the time. Mm. Um, and it was an amazing experience. I did a three year degree programme. And then I went to work um, in lots of different specialties. So primarily in um, emergency care and perioperative care. And um, I then eventually became a, um, a clinical nurse specialist and then a nurse mm. consultant in emergency and trauma surgery. Um, mm. And then um, I, I did a joint role as a nurse consultant and a deputy director of nursing and then um, in an organisation and then started to get more involved in leadership positions yeah. um, until I was the chief nurse at University Hospital Coventry in Warwickshire for a number of years before coming into national roles, firstly as a uh, deputy uh, uh, chief nurse for Ruth May um, in the NHS England, and then uh, more recently as, as Health Education England. But academically, I've always been involved in education, training and research. So I, I uh, taught and lectured at the university for both undergraduate and postgraduate programmes, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in, in specialised programmes around kind of uh, critical care and emergency care. Um, and, until I did my own PhD in research, um, mm. and then uh, since then I've been doing or continue to do research, including supervising PhD students. And I work mm. with some fantastic researchers um, doing all sorts of stuff, uh, range from kind of um, social policy mm. through to kind of say staffing to kind of big data analytics with a number of kind of research teams around the country, which is kind of really interesting side to to the role as well. I, I do that at Birmingham City University. So hugely hugely complicated path then to get to where you are at the moment um i guess because you're an educator and because you have this real live interest in students welfare it would be a really good idea for us to just just to get clear what is happening with the emergency standards for students and why is it happening Yes, Nikki. I mean, um, people listening tonight will be familiar that um, the Nursing Midwifery Council, which is our regulator um, across all four nations, mm. um, we've been working with them consistently um, for many, many uh, years around all sorts of aspects around kind of regulation development, the curriculum, etc. But of course, in the first wave of the pandemic back in March, you know, we were faced with a, an unprecedented kind of healthcare emergency and, and we've been working with them, NHS England and a range of other bodies, including the academic teams at Council mm. of Deans and Universities UK, to look at what um, the impact would be on students and learners. And, and it's really important to understand that they have been at the forefront of our kind of decision making mm. through this process. And I'll come on to that later on as we get through the, the interview. 
Um, but but in March, the emergency standards were developed by the Nursing Leave Recovery Council to be mm-hmm. applied across all four nations, and they were implemented that saw uh, in the first wave of the pandemic that our um, second and third years went out into uh, paid placements, and, and, mm-hmm. and this was primarily designed to try and uh, at least reflect the fact that um, the placements were going to be very, very different, um, you know, in terms of their kind of supervision and experience and the, the reduction of their supernumerary status. Um, but also importantly, to try and protect as much of their time around learning and opportunities for learning to, to continue with their programmes, because it was really critical mm. uh, that we, we, we did that. Um, as colleagues will know, um, we we were able to reduce the need for the emergency standards towards September of last year and try to get back to a relatively um, a normal, in inverted commas, academic cycle for, for students. And of course, um, whilst we always anticipated potentially second and third waves of the virus, um, obviously with the new variant of the virus that's been circulating mm. within England in particular, um, the, the the challenge for the health service was was really very very significant and and short uh, and sharp um, and so um, we've always been keeping this under um, consideration and review mm. not just in England but of course across all four nations which is is one of the the, the changes and um, NHS England asked the Secretary of State to reconsider the use of the emergency standards and and from that point. We've been working with um, NMC, all four nations, Councillor Deans, NHS mm-hmm. England, the Chief Nurse Ruth May, just to, to review the impact of, of that. And also importantly, um, to try and protect learning, but also the opportunity for students to be part of the pandemic response, which they are. So mm-hmm. the emergency standards were implemented after a, an emergency council meeting. Um, and at the moment, we um, are working directly with all of our universities across England to produce an assessment to see um, what is the most effective strategy to support students continue their learning where they can contribute under the emergency standards as third years in paid placement, but try to protect the learning and opportunities for those in their first and second year. And the reason I say that, Nikki, is because um, Mm -hmm. students have already had quite a disrupted 18 months um, of learning and experience already. And we know from the summer that a number of students who were second years, who are now third years this year, had delays in terms of their placement experience, some opted out and for a variety of different reasons, which meant that they've had delays in terms of their their own progression of their course, there are changes in academic teaching. Mm. There is a a ton of disruption these students have had. And importantly, Mm. um, we had to balance all of those decisions against the needs of the kind of NHS and the desire for lots of students to want to be part of that support. But secondly, also importantly, in terms of protecting the long-term graduation of those students, because obviously we don't want them to be delayed any more than we need to. And also importantly, any support that they will be offering. And, And just because you're on paid placement or not, does not mean that you're not contributing I know that students Mm. irrespective of the sector they're working and the pressure Mm. that they're under will be part of the teams will be delivering um, as part of that which I think is really important to understand and and just say a personal thank you to to all of the Mm. students in terms of what they do. Mm, Absolutely so there's a lot of players on the table it seems I can understand why I mean I've, I've been hearing from students all day they are a little bit confused still I think about what's going on. Um, and there does seem to be differences in implementation, which which we can get to in a second. But I guess one of the things I'd want to ask about is, um, as Ethan, that the health service journal has gone one way. Other people have got other comments about, you know, are we um, implementing these emergency standards too late, too early? And um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and um, you know, uh, I, I think one of the questions we need to answer is 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 the waves of the pandemic are very different i think if we were to look at the case rate back in march and we look mm-hmm. at the what i call the tail which is the kind of down slope it will be very very different and we we've, we know much more about um the virus now than we did back in march so it is not about hitting a critical point because of course mm-hmm. You know, one of the key things is that students are still students on paid placement. It's not really fair to ask mm. them to step into registered enrolled because they're not qualified. Of course, they can contribute. 
But importantly, you know, the, the pressure will be different in different sectors. It will be different in different regions of the country. Um, and importantly, the, the sustained pressure um, is, is twofold. One, it is already on the back of a very long period of time of pressure within the health service. And secondly, the, the kind of um, the nature of the pandemic and the pressure is going to be with us for, for many months. So um, uh, it wasn't to hit a specific timetable. It was about a considered uh, overview of the pressure of the NHS, where students could or could not be part of the support and solution against their learning requirements, and also importantly, the choice that students would need to make and where they could be um, best supported in terms of their learning experience, knowing that the second wave of this pandemic is likely to continue to create mm. pressures across the health and social care system mm. for, for weeks, if not mm. further months. Mm, yeah, whether we've seen the Christmas bulge or not, who knows? Who knows? We'll see. Um, there was another BBC News article that I think caused some some confusion, to be politely say. Um, so there's some students who are asking a lot about, you know, if we don't take up a paid placement, are we at risk because we don't get insurance? Can you explain what's going on with that? Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Um, and this has been one of the areas of, of, of complicated policy that we've been working directly with government and our colleagues at the Department of Health and Social Care consistently with, because I know this has been an issue that students have raised with us consistently, because Back in the original um, part, but obviously students who were students and, and not on paid placements um, are obviously are still under the kind of arrangements and support of the university. And of course, um, whilst the paid placement opportunity gave colleagues uh, a contract in that sense and, and there was um, uh, insurance associated with that. We, we did work with the Department of Social Care to, to implement an opportunity to extend that to, um, to students who um, were not on paid placement and but obviously uh, the, the legal language of this is what has caused some confusion yeah. among students which is, is this, the issue of discretion and direction and and, and what I know working with DHSC colleagues now is that they are looking to see whether they can strengthen the wording around that to be more clear for students. But, but the mm. simple fact is that we want students to know that um, whilst this language in the, in the uh, statement is confusing for students, that they will be considered for the COVID um, insurance uh, policy. Um, um, it, if they are on paid or, or on supernumerary placements accordingly. But there is a process to go through. But again, we're continuing to work with the department to provide further clarity on that for them. Mm. And we will come back to that if there's further questions on it. I guess one of the things I was also thinking about is the fact that, that the people have been a bit bewildered by what's going on. Um, and I wondered, you know, partly for you, how does it feel to be CNO during all this? Um, but also this idea about using Twitter and social media to get messages out. Um, I wondered how that's been for you. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. I, I, social media is 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 such a great tool. You know, it gives you phenomenal reach. To I feel people. like you're about to say, but <laughs> there is a but. Um, there is a but. Yes, um, um, and I've on the whole found it a really positive experience. Um, it gives you the ability to engage with people. I love some of the kind of professional discourse and engagement that I've been able to have with both students and academics and, and leaders across the globe. Um, and share experiences, which I think is really helpful. Um, and I think it's primarily around engagement, which is quite key. Um, sometimes you can just use it for kind of announcements, which I think there are other ways of, of doing that, which I think is really important to, to be clear on. Um, but there are, of course, uh, challenges with um, social media. You know, it's, it, it's a tough place and it has become increasingly tough, actually. I, I think things are quite binary. I think people really um, express some of their concerns uh, through the platform. Um, and, and I can't honestly say that I haven't been affected by that. Um, mm. You know, personally, it becomes, you know, these jobs are, are very stressful and difficult. You know, the same for, for colleagues out in clinical practice and dealing with some of the challenges they face every day. Um, and, you know, sometimes social media can be Come relentless, you know, in terms of mm. how it affects your own mental health. And I've spoken to a couple of colleagues who've personally taken quite significant breaks from social media because mm. um, it caused them quite a lot of stress and anxiety in addition to their their day job. Uh, but mm. like I say, on the whole, it's a, it's a great platform to engage, but it does sometimes have its negative sides, and and um, it, we need to kind of keep some of those things in check. Mm. Mm. It's difficult, isn't it? Because it's an emotive issue. 
Um, and there's something about social media, this kind of combination issues, isn't it? Partly um, it's such an immediate place. You immediately respond. It's an emotional place. And because it's either in your hand or in your house, it's, it's a, it kind of blurs that professional and personal boundary. But I guess around all issues like this, you know, we have to balance. We really want nurses to find their voice. We want nurses to question, particularly student nurses, to be able to um, have these conversations in ways that are professional because that's our job. So I'm I'm glad to see the students online now um, saying thanks for thanks for recognising us, um, and there'll be people I'm sure saying other things too. So we'll come to some questions in a minute when um, Dave's cycle background. But I guess I wanted to understand a little bit about you know you know you're in this sort of maelstrom at the minute as a, as a nurse and everybody can see and judge what's going on for you. I wonder how that feels for you and how you're managing that. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Um, it has been stressful at times. I, I can't admit it. I, 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 a lot of people um, only sometimes ever see the kind of sort of public face of the kind mm. of work that potentially I do and others like Ruth May and other chief nurses mm. um, a, across the country do. But, you know, uh, what drives us is is support to the front line. And I know some colleagues may not feel it's like that, but, you know, our mm. role is to interface with lots of different parts of, of government and the system to try and work through solutions that support practice you know um and it is extremely long hours you know mm. I, I i i regularly probably do uh, at least you know kind of seven till nine and mm. then have phone calls and there's a lot of work to do um mm. and particularly as i've been in the vaccine program very recently of course the drive to deliver that program is is so mm. so important means that you know the blending between a normal weekday and a weekend has, has, has gone and I equally do as much work now mm. on, on Saturdays and Sundays as well so that you know w- with it comes enormous pressure but there's an, a, an immediacy you know mm. because some of this stuff has to be done very quickly to support mm. as an example policy around thousands of students so you know we've been now since the emergency standards have been advised to us by the NMC um, myself and the team have been working are genuinely for 24 seven for the last couple of days to to redo the guide based upon what the new standards and the implications mm. are for people which involves multiple meetings and discussions with union colleagues student leaders um other arms length bodies as well as also professional organizations and mm. legal teams to make sure mm. that the advice is correct so we can get it out to students as mm. soon as possible so mm. um you know behind the scenes there's a there's a lot of work and pressure and, yeah. and but the other thing to, to be mindful, of course, is, is that there are lots of really um, senior nurses who are helping to lead the pandemic. So Ruth May, our chief mm-hmm. nursing officer, mm-hmm. the chief nursing officers at each of the devolved nations working with their government mm-hmm. um, and lots of other senior nurses around the country, you know, who are actively involved in helping mm-hmm. shape how the pandemic works and, and representing mm-hmm. both the nursing voice but also the needs and, and uh, concerns mm. of, of nurses and students. Mm. We'll come to Dave in a second um, for some questions. But before that, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the immunisations that have been, that's the other, slightly happier, presumably, part of your work. Um, it, working in the vaccination delivery programme mm. is, is is one of those mm. things I'm going to look back on in my yeah. career and say was one of the kind of proudest moments mm. of being part of something that is really quite special. I mm. um I, I've been fortunate to be part of that programme for the last kind of eight weeks, working with mm. the most astonishing uh, team of committed individuals who absolutely fundamentally get the nature of what vaccinations mean to our country. It means mm. we can save lives, means we can mm. get out of this pandemic. But but we are building a system to deliver vaccines on a scale of which is just uh, unprecedented and at a speed which is really, really critical. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, it... I still look back now, I have a notebook and I often look at these things and I wrote a note back on the 9th of January last year, which said that um, the Wuhan virus was circulating and um, could potentially be um, human to human transmission. Um, and, and and we needed to be mindful of this. And, and here we are late, you know, now we've got a vaccine that's been produced by scientists across the globe. We've got a delivery mechanism to get through mm. to the most vulnerable We've vaccinated about 8% of our population in in a Mm. matter of weeks, some of our most vulnerable, Mm. with a real ambition and commitment to get through as many of our most vulnerable out there by mid-February, which... You know, mm. is is an, and that's being done by our nurses up and down mm. the country. You know, they, they they do vaccinations day in day out. You know, they're leading mm. it at local primary care level, at hospitals, at national level, um, and it's really important to say that you know um, this gives us an opportunity um, through to get out of the 
pandemic through the vaccination program mm. um and uh, but it's uh, it's it's really really complicated and and really pressured work to do that yeah. and uh, but I, I know the team I work with and the the lead for this Emily uh, Lawson and the team I work with are just simply mm. astonishing you know in terms of their kind of drive and ambition to make sure that this delivers what it needs to do it is about people saving people's lives which is uh, amazing yeah. to be part of that yeah you had a statistic around that for every 20 vaccinations you save a life yeah absolutely I and mean, we talk about huge, that isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and we, we, we talk about that every single day. We have, you know, an early morning leadership meeting and our, our, and our priority is people and citizens. Mm. We always talk about it in those terms of how many how many uh, vaccinations have we been able to give? What does that mean in terms of life safe? How many people mm. in care homes have received their, their vaccination? And, uh, uh, and and that focus is really important, you know, because mm. th- this is th- these are people's relatives out there. And mm. um, it's really important to understand, you know, the emotion attached to this. Um, I've met colleagues and I've been to some vaccination areas where, you know, people genuinely are quite emotional when they've had their vaccine because it means they can go and see their grandchildren sometime mm. soon. It mm. means um, the staff giving the vaccine, you know, is amazing. And, and I, I look at uh, May, who gave the first injection to um, the lady in Coventry, you know, um, and, and just great globally to see one of our Philippines nurses um, who works in our NHS giving the first mm. vaccine in the world, mm. which is something mm. the NHS does does really mm. well. But, mm. you know, we've got so much more to do. There's so much work to do. And I know that nursing colleagues up and down the country will be working their socks off to make sure that they can get out to vaccinate their patients mm. and service users. Mm. Absolutely. We come over to Dave. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, yeah, we've had a few questions in. I think before I tackle the questions, though, I just wanted to kind of emphasise a few of the bits that, that Mark's already mentioned. And uh, obviously, we've been working really closely with Mark alongside uh, myself and, and Jane Beach, who's our lead for regulation uh, on the issues around student nurses. Uh, and obviously, we're really grateful to our members who have been involved in those conversations and, and given us really important feedback about the work that we've done on that. But it's also to emphasise the fact that it's been very much cross-union. So it's not just Unite, obviously, that's involved in this discussion. We've always also been working with colleagues from the Royal College of Nurses, uh, Unison, uh, and the Royal College of Midwives. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's been very much a, a cross-party kind of piece of work. I think one of the things that I would also want to emphasise, and I think this comes down to uh, one of the problems that we sometimes face, is the way that obviously Mark works as a, a civil servant having to enact government policy. Uh, sometimes we can be quite critical of what the government does do. Uh, and I suppose it's that sort of uh, the, the, the pressure between the, the, the two sides of, you know, wanting to support the work that Mark does uh, and, and, and his colleagues at NHS England, NHS Improvement and Health Education England, but also being concerned about some of the aspects and, 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 and having criticisms mm. of them. I think one of the examples of that is this bit about uh, the insurance scheme for students. Uh, and I think one of the questions that's, that's coming from Kevin uh, is, is picked up on, on the comment that you made, Mark, uh, they will be considered. Uh, Mark, mm. how can students or other health uh, HEIs make a decision without having insurance issues clarified? Yeah, thanks, Dave. And, and you know, so so obviously there, there's 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 the legal language that that is you know where we have been working with officials and colleagues across government to to nail that down to be to be clear on that. But there is also you know the, the, the clear intention. That, that students are are included in that. So you know, whilst I understand, you know, the, the word considered is is obviously a concern. It means that any student can apply to the process, of course. Um, but there is a, an assessment process that goes into that. Now, um, we will continue to work with our officials at the Department of Health and Social Care to refine that to give some more clarity and certainty uh, for both universities as well as also importantly. Um, the students themselves to give them some um, support. Um, it, it is also important to, to recognise that the students are also um, supported by the universities themselves. So um, whilst we have the COVID insurance scheme for NHS staff and also uh, that is uh, accessible to students under the terms that you've identified, 
Um, the universities also have a kind of arrangement and support requirement in terms of students in need. So it is, you know, something we continue to work on with the council of deans. But like I say, um, part of the work that I described to Nikki in terms of some of the long hours does relate to um, and making sure that we can further ask questions and, and further make assessments against issues that students and AEIs raise with us. Um, and I know that this issue around insurance is one that we are actively talking about now to, to provide further clarity on. Yeah, and I, I personally am really hopeful that, that things will change soon. And, and I, I noticed, and I've already shared on uh, Twitter this evening, uh, that uh, Nadim Zahawi made a, a statement about uh, two other issues uh, in the uh, a written statement, uh, one about uh, liabilities for care homes and the other about uh, liabilities for community pharmacists. So hopefully, you know, similar yes. to, the, to those two issues being big issues for, for sort of COVID insurance, that hopefully uh, the one for students as well will be similarly clarified very soon. Uh, just to go on to the next question that we've had in, uh, this is from uh, Jackie White. Uh, I'm thinking about the longer term consequences on workforce planning and the needs of students earlier in their education pathway, so first, second and the beginning of third year, and the impact all of this has on them. Has this been considered or is this a crisis management decision? No. Um uh, we, we are in a public health emergency, so I'm not going to say that we um, are, are not in very difficult territory. Um, we are at a level five. The chief medical officers across all four nations agreed that. So we are in a public health emergency. Was it a crisis decision and knee-jerk decision? No. So, you know, it was carefully considered um, with uh, a, 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 an analysis and assessment of all of the issues that we've described. So one of the issues, of course, is that our first years last year, who are second years, many of them didn't get a great deal of clinical practice last year because um, they were, um, because of the emergency standards implemented in March, they, they, they didn't go out. Um, and our second years were delayed. So um, we do have a number of students um, who were delayed uh, in their progression onto the next year, but also potentially a group of students that would be delayed uh, from graduating um, uh, this summer. And so we are working with the Department of Education, Department of Health and Social Care, and also directly with universities to mitigate all of that. So prior to going into making any of these decisions, mm -hmm. A thorough risk assessment is done in relation to a quite granular level information at down to university level and individual student to understand what the implications and risks and therefore the decision point will be. Um, and, and one of the kind of critical issues, of course, is that uh, the kind of number of hours that students still need to do under the um, NMC requirements is still a requirement alongside their competency assessment. So, you know, any further disruption will materially affect students' ability to achieve those. And so it's a balanced decision between the needs of the kind of NHS and the support that students can offer, the continuity of their education, primarily because in the medium to long term, um, we need these colleagues to graduate, to join um, a, 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 an exciting and vibrant NHS and social care system, um, which is the career that they chose. So, you know, d disruption doesn't, doesn't benefit many, many people, um, but it is important to recognise the risks and balance those out in the decision making that takes place. So, um, yes, we um, uh, are constantly, and it's a discussion I had with Health Education England Board today, um, in public, which was about the medium to long term supply concerns and issues mm. that this may have. However, what we have agreed to do is a series of actions working with both government departments and also importantly universities to mitigate that as much as possible to ensure that both universities um, can support their students and also uh, students can graduate uh, on time. Um, many mm. students will, of course, uh, there will be a group of students that we're going to need to work hard with to ensure they get the hours requirements as well as also, importantly, their competency assessments too. I think one of the things that, that as, as Jackie has raised there is this idea about that long-term consequences. This is all coming on top of the fact that we already were in crisis with recruitment numbers, with sustaining nurses in the profession, and I think if we don't treat people properly and with respect and compassion now, how on earth are we even going to start turning that around? Yeah, it's it's a really good point, Nikki. I mean, I, I I've been 
working really closely around um, with both Ruth May, our chief nursing officer, and also with universities and government to to in, to boost the number of people coming into nursing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were a number of barriers to doing that, and and some of that that we've been working to address. So this year we saw the reintroduction of the learning support fund, a non repairable grant for students. Um, uh, as well as also changes in terms of additional placement availability. Um, we've done a significant marketing campaign. We've also looked at attrition from courses and invested uh, money to support that, as well as also an additional £15 million to support practice placement. So we've, we've tried to examine all of the issues around the barriers that prevent people coming into the profession, both at university level, individual level, and also from a policy perspective. Um, And this year, we've seen the largest ever increase in the number of student nurses starting um, on programmes. You know, in England, it is up by 26%. Um, Now, of course, large number of students coming in during the middle of the pandemic is is, uh, really uh, fantastic that people are choosing to come into our profession. But the disruption and the challenges that the sector is facing does mean that there is a high probability of risks associated with attrition from courses. So, you know, as Health Education England, we're working again directly with the universities to look at how do we look at and examine some of those issues around course continuity, around um, uh, students who intermit, who, who take a pause from their programme, um, and, and also work with the universities to make sure that they're supported. And, and a key to that is pastoral support. And that's not just about the university, that's practice placement. We have enough feedback from students that sometimes um, their experiences on placements are less than ideal. Um, And it is really important that it's a joint enterprise as nurses. If we want more nurses to be in nursing, we have to look after our students. It's as simple as that. Mm. However, it's not just about importantly producing more nurses through our universities. And that is brilliant in itself. However, we do have to have um, retention of the nurses we have in practice. You know, um, uh, I worked with Ruth May leading a programme of retention work. We looked at a range of programmes when we were with NHS Improvement. I know that now as part of the people plan, Chief People Officer Prona is, is is very much taking forward lots of uh, interventions. Um, and I know during the pandemic, lots of colleagues um, have stayed on in clinical practice to support them, their mm. colleagues. I know that that's happened. Um, we know that staff have been under enormous pressure. They've experienced moral hazards. They've experienced um, uh, potentially burnout. We know that some uh, colleagues certainly um, have experienced mental health challenges. So there is a clear and present issue in terms of support for staff, um, not just now whilst they're going through the pandemic, but this will be with us for years. So, you know, and I can't disaggregate students from that either. Our students have been in clinical practice all the way through the pandemic. They will have seen things, been part of... Uh, conversations with families and relatives that would have been distressing. So, you know, supervision and support is so critical, both at university Mm. level and in clinical practice, because those students will be in the workforce. Um, Some are now and some will be coming in in the next few years. And it's really incumbent on us. We recognise what they've achieved and Mm. what they've been through and what support they need to, particularly as newly qualified, because that is a really critical part of being able to keep people in the profession for the long term, is that kind of initial support in the early years of the career. Mm. I think you're right. I think as well, we can't forget the fact that a lot of them are working bank and agency anyway, just to keep their heads above water. Correct. So, you know, they're not a separate thing. They're already threaded through the system. I can see loads of questions coming in. So should we go back over to Dave? Yeah, so we've got uh, another question here from Joy O'Gorman. Uh, and she's asked, do you know the type of support that local trusts are asking for help with from nursing students? What role does Matt Hancock see final year nursing students providing? And aside from the obvious crisis and having a defined band for role, what are the main gaps currently? Great question, Joy. Um, and one of our student leaders. So um, great to, to hear her voice. And we've been engaging a lot with, with Joy. So, um, well, the, the, the first part of call is, is, is the, the band for designation under Agenda for Change is to re- reflect the, the experience of the student, but they are still a student on paid placement. So I think it's 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 one of the challenges, of course, with this is is I don't want students to be pegged into a very specific role profile when they are out in practice, because um, there is risk and danger in that, particularly as in the first wave, we know that some students were 
uh, just uh, expected to be used as a as a support worker when actually they were still required to be supervised. They may have not been the supernumerary, but of course we know that the students under supervision are able to give a wider uh, degree of care on, on their scope of practice. So it's really important that learning is still part of that. Of course, the contract is important to identify the change in the supernumerary status. And that is important to reflect that actually um, we are asking particularly for students to be supported in, in this clinical practice, knowing that they will be contributing, whether they're in their first or their third year, but it will be very different for the, for the third years. So I'm, I'm cautious about saying that they are there to replace X or Y other role in clinical practice. They are there to augment already the existing teams that we know are already under pressure within their defined scope of practice, under supervision, um, within the clinical teams they're operating in. Now, some of us um, remember the old days where students were paid, and actually, in some cases, students um, learning came second. So if there was a gap somewhere, a student nurse could be pulled off and moved to another part of an organisation because that's where the gap was. So these types of apprentice model of history where students were paid um, is are equally problematic. And, and going down this route potentially, again, I think is something that as a profession we really need to be um, mindful of is not the right direction of travel. Supernumerary status for students was hard won. Um, and there's a good reason for that, because their learning should be protected as far as possible. But in the current public health emergency, these changes are, are reflective of that. But the paid placement opportunity does al allow some changes. Um, I think Joy mentioned, what does Matt Hancock, our Secretary of State, think? Uh, well, well, Matt, Matt is the Secretary of State and, and we work with him a lot. Um, but of course, uh, what uh, the Secretary of State does is, is it seeks advice. Uh, it seeks advice from really senior nurses um, about the implications of this, including myself and, and Ruth May. So um, we've advised about the continuity of their education. We've uh, identified about their needs to support the service, particularly in terms of the, uh, the scope of the capabilities, depending on where they are in their kind of programme. Um, but this isn't about trying to plug a specific gap. We need to still ensure that there are learning opportunities, even though that we are still within this public health emergency. I think on that point, just I'd want to emphasise the the position that the uh, NHS trade unions have taken. That we very much wanted to kind of continually remind NHS England Improvement and HEE about the need for them to assure themselves that this is the right time to take this step. That obviously we're anxious that students should have a, a good experience, uh, and obviously you know those assurances have been repeatedly given to us, and and we have to take some of that in faith in terms of you know the the the, the ability that you guys mm -hmm. have got to uh, get feedback from the service from the routes that you use to make make sure that that that's yeah. the case. Uh, just on a similar point, uh, my care academy they uh, asked a question, uh, and their question was. We were wondering how services will manage to support the students when their existing day-to-day -day workload is so demanding. Also, what did we learn from the first wave and emergency measures could be helpful this time? Yeah, some really good questions there. So we, we know that the, the pandemic is different in different regions across the country. So some places are under different pressures. Um, changes in clinical model are quite significant, particularly out in, pri in, in community and primary care. Um, and even in some organisations, the pressure is very, very different. So one of the reasons with the introduction of the emergency standards is to, is to produce a, a, gr a granular level of flexibility for individual universities to work with their student bodies and their NHS providers and make an informed decision about what is the most. So, so removing supernumerary status is a serious thing to do. And it's not something that should be done lightly because it has implications in terms of the student experience that we need to be mindful of. And that is something we learned through the first wave. Uh, we had over 11,000 students uh, feedback as part of the feedback of the pandemic. And we're about to publish the results of that um, very soon. And also we're going to repeat that survey to look longitudinally about the impact of things. And what they said was, um, it, uh, the disruption was sometimes problematic for the continuity of their studies. Um, sometimes induction and supervision wasn't correct. And in some cases, they, they were not used as a, as a student in paid placement. They, they were sometimes 
um, asked to go and do other tasks in the organisation, in some cases beyond their scope. So, you know, people were asking them to do things that possibly registrants should be doing versus those that felt that they were just being used as a pair of hands. So, um, you know, as Health Education England, we work directly with our universities and also with our provider trust to listen and understand about the experience about students and also intervene should there be concerns. Now, now the, the, the worst case scenario of that is that students would be removed from clinical practice, whether they were on paid placement or not, if they were unable to achieve their uh, requirements and um, things. But on the other hand, most of these things can be resolved by working with the organisations, changing some of the supervision arrangements or some of the policies to ensure students are working. So I know one, one organisation has asked the students to pause their placement for three or four days so they can relook at what is the best way to organise the student placements to get the best placement experience for them, some on paid mm -hmm. placement and some um, in, in supernumerary parts of the organisation that are under different um, pressures um, and different types of service model. I've also heard of organisations that are looking for students who may have been shielding or, or at high risk and, and they're looking at placement opportunities such as vaccinations as an example um, for them to gain experience in things like public health and assessment. So um, I, I think we've tried to introduce as much flexibility, provide oversight because obviously a key role of health education is the quality of the training and experience and that is something that we also jointly hold with the NMC and it's something we have a, we have a weekly operational meeting with our NMC colleagues and also the university sector to look at student experience any issues that crop up um, but uh, and we would obviously support any changes directly as a result of, of that uh, whether they're a positive experience and we must recognize that actually a lot of students had a really positive experience during wave one um, but we also know there were concerns and, and, and challenges and, and you know our role is to work with the universities and the trust to make sure that they're addressed. I guess one of the things that strikes me with it's great, you know, that people have flexibility, but arguably <laughs> it could be that the, the decision is being pushed further and further down the chain so that nobody has to take real responsibility for an overview. And also then I wonder what will happen to students, not just getting bad or good placements, but students who are actually on the same course you know, getting completely different experiences. That, that's a concern, maybe. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. I mean, uh, no, I mean, accountability and responsibility sits with me and other senior nurses. There's, uh, that, mm. That's what we are paid to do. So, you mm. know, providing oversight and governance to the both the policy and the decision making is quite critical. Mm. Um, but it's also about making sure that we work with our regional infrastructure, which is where we have senior nurses working in the regions who directly plug into um, organisations like the Council of Deans who have been phenomenal partners in this. And of course, deans in universities are often either nurses or allied health professions or midwives. So equally, they are registrants. So, you know, there's a very clear line of sight professionally, right through from, from national policy decision making, right through to an individual trust and university, mm -hmm. where the needs of the students are understood in relation to the NMC standards, but also in terms of the professional requirements. So, um, yeah, I can see why people would say, well, you know, it's just pushing the problem down. But actually, actually, it provides a greater level of flexibility on the needs of individual students and universities, because, like I say, you know, um, mm. taking away supernumerary status is, is, a, is a serious consideration, you know, because of the changes it makes to mm. the students and learning experience. So do, doing that is not undertaken lightly. And if there are mm. opportunities not to do that, to preserve the learning opportunities, then we work with universities to, to make sure that that is the correct decision for them and their students. Mm, absolutely. Let's come back to David so I can see there's a couple more questions come through. And, and then it's flown by, but we're going to have to start thinking it about going to a close soon. <laughs> so let's come back to Dave for a bit. Well, uh, just before I do one of the questions, I, I wanted to raise the point. I, I think what was interesting was during the first wave, obviously, I think much more decision making was made centrally and the kind of the options for uh, people to do things locally different were, was more difficult. And I think that created a, a number of problems that, that had impacts. I think what's interesting this time is that obviously the decision has been taken to make it much more of a kind of a local decision making opportunity. Mm. Uh, and I think that will create problems as well. And I think the problem is, is that it's, it's near on impossible to get a happy medium between the two. Uh, it's just trying to do the, the best that we can, really. Uh, and I suppose, you know, as in with all of these things, if students have got concerns, then there's a whole host of people that they should be able to get support from, whether that's from their university, whether it's from their providers, 
And of course, whether it's from their trade union representatives, you know, it's really important that students share those conversations. And like Mark said, it's not just Unite that's been conversing with our students, but the other trade unions as well. So if, if you are a member of a, a different trade union, do get involved in your student committees, uh, have those okay. conversations because it's it's really important. Now, one of the questions that, that Kevin Acots asked, which I think is a really Really helpful question mark yeah. to kind of set you up for a, 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 an answer that I'm sure you'll want to give. Is there <laughs> any way in which a clear definitive statement could come out from HEE NMC that addresses all the issues that students, HEIs and trusts are raising? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you want a bit more than that. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, we, we have listened extensively from student leaders, voices of students, trade union colleagues, universities and provider trusts. We have a large number of questions that students and, and we have uh, working or my colleagues, uh, Liz and Noella and James, um, working with NHSE colleagues and Councillor Deans developed a, a very detailed document that we aim to publish that will have lots of frequently asked questions in there that some of them I'm sure have been raised tonight. Um, we, uh, Like I say, we've been working directly with lots of different parts of both um, the education system, government system, to be really, really clear on this and to make sure that we've got absolutely buttoned down advice for students and their educators, but also their placement providers. Um, but it's a dynamic process, Dave. So, you know, we, we are constantly getting feedback. If there are things that we need to address or change, then you're right, absolutely. Please raise them with your trade union. Uh, officers or your placement as well as also importantly your university and we have a direct feed in each and every day to um, review decision making points and, and the things come in each day we know we've got September and March cohorts as an example we've got postgraduate courses we've got undergraduate we've got four years months. so there's lots of complexity with 57 mm. universities four branch programmes with a multitude of different permutations of that. Um, and no big national policy can necessarily cover all of that, but we there is a willingness to make sure that as feedback comes in or questions of clarification are required, we'll work with the NMC, um, Andrea and Jerry and Alex to confirm those if there's a regulatory requirement on there. And if there's something related to the universities, we do that through our Council of Dean colleagues, Katerina and Flair have been phenomenal. Um, and then, of course, directly through into our provider organisations with the chief nurses. So there is a letter that's gone tonight um, from myself and Ruth May directly to um, provider chief nurses describing um, this and also other further documents that will be out very soon to be clear on that. And like I say, I'm very happy to try and connect with students groups as much mm. as possible to kind of, you know, in examples like this, to to answer some of those questions where I can. And I don't always have the answer. So, you know, sometimes I will plead the, yep, I'll take that away, go and look about it and then mm. uh, make sure that we can provide appropriate advice on that. So um, we will continue to work and listen and understand how this process will evolve and make sure that students are front and centre part of our decision making alongside colleagues in the NHS and social care system that are under extreme pressure at the moment in the middle of the pandemic. Okay, Dave? Right, just uh, I want to give a shout out to one of our adversaries, RCN Mental Health <laughs> Forum out there. Thanks for watching <laughs> along tonight. Uh, we do love you really. Uh, and thanks for all the tweeting that you've been doing and encouraging mm. people to watch it live or to watch the re watch the recording. So, so thanks for that. Uh, there's been another question in, and this kind of goes over to the subject of immunisation. So just let me find this one because I've gone off the screen. Right. It was basically about nurse. nurses being really good no, at no, jabbing I've got people. It, I've got it, I've got it. Yes, <laughs> Go on. So, uh, some mental health nurse academics and nurse academics from other fields are experts in deltoid intramuscular injection practice. Is there a role for them in the vaccination effort? So, gosh, there's, there's, there's so much to unpick there. Um, uh, we, we know that about 15% of the population um, actually are needle phobic. So uh, we actually try and avoid the use of the word jab because in some cases it might create vaccine hesitancy. So we do like Absolutely. to call it vaccination. Um, uh, the other question for me is, uh, yes, I, I remember training and learning how to inject an orange um, as a student nurse a million years ago. Um, but actually, the act of doing a vaccination is, is a very simple task in itself. However, the complexity 
is the consenting process, is the guidance, is the discussion with the patient, is the assessment, is looking out for the contraindications, it's about making sure that you counsel them, you go through the consent process. So um, when, uh, when, when I often have these debates with people say, oh, well, we can just quickly, you know, inject somebody. Actually, immunisation is a complex process, mm. you know, and, and I wouldn't even begin to say that as a as an emergency care nurse, I'd be good as a, an immunisation nurse or a health visitor or a general practice nurse who don't do this day mm. in, day out. However, I know that there are lots of people out there who are really enthusiastic to be part of the vaccination programme. And I would encourage them to link into their local primary care network. There is a number of lead employers in there that uh, if they wish to be part of, uh, even if it's a, a, a day or two a month, uh, even providing support, they will get some additional training on top of what their experience allows uh, for them to be part of the kind of vaccination effort. And uh, I know certainly um, we are very much uh, looking at, at areas to vaccinate within mental health settings. We've got secure units, we've got high secure units. Um, and uh, other types of environment where it's really critical that uh, mental health nurses with their skills and capability could be absolutely front and centre in vaccination programmes. Absolutely. I think we're going to have to start wrapping up now. So I guess we'll come round and find out if there's any messages that people want to to leave people who are watching with. So Dave, is there anything that you wanted to uh, finish up with? Is there some nice comments, Dave? <laughs> Oh, yes. oh, golly God. Uh, there are. <laughs> I, I, I suppose it's, it's a dangerous one to, to, well, there's two. So the first one, I'll, I'll do the more dangerous one. I think that, you know, this certainly isn't a criticism of especially Mark, but anyone involved from NHS England, NHS Improvement or Health Education England. But I do think that one of the things that this thing uncovers, although it's already been uncovered, is a real issue about funding and how we reward and remunerate students in healthcare settings uh, and I think there's that that real issue about you know at the moment we expect students to have to pay a graduate tax to be able to become healthcare professionals and obviously COVID has kind of brought some of that into the forefront and, 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 and sort of shone a light on it but it's certainly something as a country that I think we need to urgently address mm -hmm. because we need to support our healthcare professionals much, much more. And I was really struck yesterday when I was watching the Commons uh, PAC, the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, I watched that session live and I shared some clips on YouTube from them. Uh, and the way that officials from the Department of Health defended the uh, fact that consultants are being paid £1,000 a day to uh, you know, provide consultancy on test and trace. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think that does sound quite uh, abhorrent, uh, but maybe that you know that is appropriate in terms of, of the work that they're doing. Uh, but when you compare it with healthcare students, you know, we don't see the same kind of defence or fight from DH uh, in terms of making them have uh, better, uh, you know, support in terms of the the, the the valuable work that they do for the country. Uh, so you know, I, I, I kind of want to say that because I think it's a really important point. But it's not a point for Mark to address. It's not a point mm -hmm. for you know, uh, to, to, you know, to, to really debate tonight. I wouldn't say. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say was, you know, we absolutely know that students have made such a huge impact to the fight uh, against COVID, and you know, I'm certainly grateful. When when I was in hospital, uh, having suffered from COVID, I was treated by a couple of student nurses, uh, and you know. A, you just see the, the huge impact that they're, uh, they're making and, and, and thank you to, to all of you. Uh, I just wanted to finish by saying that Joe Johnson, our, uh, our previous uh, student mental health nurse on the uh, mental health nurse uh, editorial board, wrote a really good article in a recent journal about her experiences be, being on a paid placement. And we'll share that again later tonight. And I would encourage everyone to read it because, you know, she, she really was kind of really sort of... Uh, positive about the experience that, that she, she had. Uh, and just on that point, we are actually looking for a student nurse member, a new student nurse member on our editorial board. So if you are a student nurse that's interested in writing for the best uh, best mental health nursing journal in the country, then uh, this is your opportunity. And I'll share some information about that on Twitter as well. So hopefully I didn't take too long there, Nikki, but that, th those are my closing remarks. I forgot to ask what the medics are up to. Is there a thumbnail? Are they getting paid? Are they what's the situation with the doctors or student doctors? 
Uh, so uh, medical students actually have had some changes in their curriculum plan, which which has mm-hmm. uh, freed up, um, I think it's around 10 to 12 hours of their, their week for them to volunteer um, mm-hmm. in a non-paid role to supporting organisations. Um, and I know many medical students have already taken up that opportunity to be able to support that. Um, and I know that uh, Suzanne Rastrick, the chief Allied Health Professions Officer is having similar discussions to us about what opportunities there might be for AHP students um, in a similar way that we would do that. But obviously, that's a, a different uh, group of professions entirely. So obviously, mm. uh, my focus is primarily on, on nurses. Mm. OK. All right. So could you leave us with uh, your, your thoughts then? Um, thanks, Nikki. Um, a thank you, actually. Um, I want to thank um, our student colleagues out there. This mm-hmm. has been a really, really challenging time for them. I know that mm-hmm. each and every one of them have made some very difficult decisions over this last year. Um, I've absolutely no doubt whatever choice they've made, uh, they have contributed and they're going to contribute in future as part of our profession. Um, a thank you mm-hmm. to their academic staff because, you know, this has been a huge upheaval for our universities and their uh, educators and practice support teams that I know have been working 24-7 to support students, uh, support us in policy and also implementation. And I know many lecturers have also gone out into clinical practice. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it's really recognising that everybody has made a monumental effort to support and manage COVID as much as possible and um, it, my job is really to try and, and, and support them working with Ruth May the chief nurse to make sure that coming through this pandemic that we make sure that we are supporting nurses we're supporting students and making sure that um, we're able to support them into a, a long-term and fruitful and supported career in in the NHS or social care so um, just a thank you really to a, a mm. people out there who um, have yeah. been through the last year. It's been really, really tough for everybody. And just thanks for all of your time and support. Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing that always sticks with me as well is that is that kind of hidden curriculum stuff. You know, we try very hard, I think, to to give people a really good education, but it's not necessarily what we say, it's what we do as well. So it's how we follow through on giving these messages about your your cared about, your valued. I think we need to show it as well. So I think this is an excellent opportunity. See how people see how people find it. But thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in tonight. We really appreciate seeing you. Um, we're back tomorrow as well, so uh, do, do tune in if you if you're up uh, able to do that. But other than that, thank you very much again. You're really um, what your work is really valued by us all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.